Hi class, we are going to be doing uh, gas laws today and for this lecture, chapter 11, I'm not able to be with you, so this uh, presentation is videotaped for your convenience. Um, I would recommend making sure you know how to work all the problems that I work for you and uh, work more problems in the textbook, read the textbook, and do the sapling homework as assigned, and then we should all be good. So in chapter 11, we're dealing with gases, and in order to, in order to understand gases, we need to talk about the different components and different variables that, that affect gases' behavior. One of the main ones that we deal with, well, there's three main ones that we need, four main ones that we need to deal with, deal with but the first one we'll talk about is pressure. Pressure is essentially the force of the gas molecules running into the walls of the container. So you can see on this slide, these little molecules or atoms, whatever, it doesn't matter what they are, have direction and they have speed and when they hit the wall, they're going to hit with a, they're going to hit with a force and this force is pressure. <clears throat> so when they collide with the walls, that gives you the, the pressure of the gas inside that container. And the sum of all the collisions is called the pressure. This is a, a little chemical reaction that sodium azide is one of the chemicals used in airbags, and it's a solid, it's an ionic compound solid, and when it, it it's quite unstable, and when it has enough energy input from a collision, it will actually decompose into solid sodium and nitrogen gas. And the nitrogen gas is what fills the airbag and prevents the, the person from being injured as severely as if the airbag wasn't there. So gases work great because they can be compressed, we can, we know that we can, how much we're going to get from a given volume of solid, and so it, it, it works really great. So here's a quiz question for you, and what I would recommend you doing is, when you're watching this, read the quiz and pause the video, and then see if you get the right answer, and the answer will be on the next slide. So pause the video right now and, and see if you can answer this question. The answer is actually number one. No, sorry, it's number two. It's number two, force divided by unit area. One of the pressure units that we'll talk about that uh, defines this is pound per square inch. This is a very common pressure unit. We use it in, in bike tires and car tires, basketballs, and we want to know the pressure of the gas inside. And so that unit of pound per square inch defines what pressure is. It's a force divided by unit area. So pound is a force and unit area would be a square inch. So that's the definition of pressure. So this picture is kind of interesting because it, it shows two different conditions. It shows gas molecules inside someone's ear and gas molecules outside someone's ear. Here's the eardrum membrane separating the two. So you can look at this and say, gosh, where's the pressure higher? Well, obviously the place that has more gas molecules is going to have a higher pressure if the temperature is the same and the volume of this constant. So this can tell you some conditions where this person is. If you think about where conditions might be where someone would have a higher pressure inside their ear than outside, maybe on an airplane where the pressure has an equalized inside their, in their inner ear. If you're a scuba diver, you can actually have this be water on the outside, and as divers go underwater, the eardrum will go this way because the pressure pushing in on the eardrum is so much higher. So that's one of the issues that, that divers need to 
do is how to equalize the pressure inside their ear versus outside in the uh, in the water. And you do that on airplanes too. This table shows different units of pressure. In chemistry, we usually use, or more most commonly use, the unit called atmospheres, right here in the middle, atmospheres. And this table tells you how many, what the qualities are between atmospheres and other pressure units. How an atmosphere is, is defined is if you are at sea level, and you have a unit of area that is one square meter, and, you ha and you'll have a column of air that extends way up into space from the Earth's surface at sea level up into space, that air mass is going to have a pressure. It's going to exert pressure on the Earth's surface where, where you're standing. And that pressure is defined as one atmosphere pressure. Here's the pound per square inch unit that I talked about, the, the definition is, well, the unit is PSI, but it means pound per square inch. There's that force divided by unit area. Some other very common ones are tors and millimeters of mercury, which actually these two units are the same. And so what I'd expect you to be able to do is make conversions between these pressure units. So we'll do a problem next where we can practice doing that. So here's the problem. You have a, you're way down, you've gone diving, and it's, you've gone crazy and gone 330 feet. At that depth, the pressure of the water would be 11 atmospheres. What would be the pressure in PSI? Well, here's the answer, 162 PSI. So why don't you pause the video and see if you can get that calculation using that table that I just showed on the previous slide, and it's in the textbook, see if you can get that answer, 162 PSI. So pause the video, and I'm going to show you how to work the problem next. Okay, so we start with 11 atmospheres, and we want to convert that into pound per square inch. Well, the conversion factor one atmosphere is equal to 14.7 PSI. So that's the equality that you get from that table. So we start with what's given, 11 atmospheres, and we use that equality to have the conversion factor that we need. One atmosphere goes in the bottom, and 14 0.7 PSI goes on top, the atmosphere cancels out, and we have the answer that was on the bottom of the slide, 162 PSI. Or with the correct six figs, I guess it'd be 160 PSI. So if you think about the pressure in your in your car tire, what is that relative to, to this? You know, bike tires could be 50 PSI or 100 PSI. Okay, we'll do the next slide. Okay, here's another problem for you to practice. Uh, this is a, a quiz question that we do in class with our clickers, but again, stop the video and see if you can answer this question. The pressure on top of Mount Everest is 241.4. What is this pressure in atmospheres? And I actually gave you the conversion between atmospheres and tor, that would be on that table um, in the book. I, and I don't expect you to memorize these pressure conversions. They'll be given to you, but you need to know how to do it. So again, stop the video and see if you can get the right answer. So the answer is 0.317 atmosphere. I will show you how to work that. All right, so we said it was 241. Okay, so we have 241 tor, and I want to convert that to atmosphere. And I know that one atmosphere is equal to 
equal to 760 torque. So I would just use this conversion, 760 torque times one, divide by 760 times by one atmosphere, torque cancels out, and we're left with that 0 0.314 atmosphere. So if you're on the top of Mount Everest, you don't have very much atmospheric pressure pushing down on you, and people that climb Mount Everest have a very, very limited time that they can be at that elevation because there's just not enough oxygen to sustain life. Oh. 317 atmospheres. Sorry. The answer is 0 0.317 atmospheres. I, I remember the wrong one on the board. Anyway, so this is actually a picture of Mount Everest. Mount Everest is the, the mountain in the background that has the cloud billowing off of it. Um, that's actually so high that it's touching the bottom of the stratosphere. We'll talk more about that later. Um, anyway, that's a picture of me when I was trekking in Nepal and went to, went to the Everest region in Nepal in the Himalayas uh, base camp is actually over here, and I was, I was about 18,000 feet in elevation when this picture was taken, a little over 18,000 feet, and base camp was about 1,000 feet below. So I knew exactly the effects of having limited oxygen um, at that elevation. It was very difficult at that pressure and, and lack of low oxygen levels. This graphic shows what atmospheric pressure does. If you have a straw that has an open tube, and I don't know if you can see the laser pointer, but this is this tube is open to the atmosphere. <clears throat> the pressure inside the tube is the same as outside the tube, and so the, the level of the liquid is equal inside, inside and outside the tube. So how some of these units of pressure were developed were by using a system like this, where the tube was evacuated, it had a vacuum in it, and you put the end of the tube in a liquid and you have the atmospheric pressure pushing down on this liquid and the force will actually force the liquid up the column of, the, of that tube. So some of those pressure units are inches of mercury or millimeters of mercury, and that actually deals with the height of the column of liquid mercury that would be forced up that column due to the atmospheric pressure. So that's where some of those units come from, um, some of the barometric atmospheric pressures. This graph just talks about some of the uh, pressure conditions that a weatherman might report. This is what we call an isobaric graph, where like everything within this uh, yellow line would have the same pressure. And you can see where the lines are close together. It's kind of like a topographic map, where you have lines together, like in this region, it means that there's large pressure differentials, which typically is associated with storm fronts, and air mass is moving, and pressure changes, and so, you know, that this would, you'd be able to tell where on this map the weather pattern is stable and where there'd be some uh, storms coming in. So high atmospheric pressure, that's what these H's mean on this graph. The high atmospheric pressure means that it, the storms would be directed around that air mass and it'd be fair weather. Whereas the low atmospheric pressure indicated by the Greener lines or lower numbers would mean that uh, you'd be having stormy weather. And when you have changes in, in pressure, and that's really what wind is, is the air mass is rushing from a high pressure to a lower pressure. That's that's what wind, one of the causes for wind. So now let's talk about these properties of gases that I've mentioned. We've already talked about pressure a lot because pressure has lots of different units and we need to understand what it is and it's actually 
the force of the gas molecules hitting the wall of the container. And there's, but there's some other fundamental properties that we need to define. So the first we've defined are in pressure, and the common unit of that is atmosphere, and it's abbreviated ATM. That's the uh, that is the unit. The other one is temperature. The temperature scale that you need to work with when you're dealing with gases is actually the Kelvin scale. And I'll talk about the Kelvin scale and how you make conversions between Kelvin and Celsius and Fahrenheit in a little bit. But that's one of the variables. And pressure and temperature are related. If you have a if you have a a container that has a rigid volume, maybe a, a metal uh, oh, a pressure cooker, for example, where the volume is constant, and you, and you put that pressure cooker on the stove and you start heating up the material that's in there, the gases, what's going to happen is the temperature of the gas inside the pressure cooker increases. What happens to the pressure inside? Well, think about that. How are temperature and pressure related if the volume is constant? Well, if you think about it, you'll know that if the volume is constant, like in a pressure cooker, the, as the temperature increases, the pressure will also increase, which means that pressure and temperature are directly related. Another one is that we that we need to talk about is volume. Usually, the volume for these gas laws that we'll be learning about is given in in units of liters. And the other one is the amount of the gas. Um, all of all of these variables are they affect the other variables. If you keep the pressure and temperature and volume of a gas constant, but you add more of that gas, the pressure is going to go up because you have more gas molecules hitting the wall of the container. So we're going to think about how all these things are related. Usually, the amount of the gas, or always for these gas laws, we measure the amount in moles which for gas laws, we actually define a mole, we use the symbol italic N to, uh, to talk about what moles are. That's, that's how we indicate a mole. So if you change one of those things, the other things can change as well. They're, they're interrelated. They're linearly, directly related, or indirectly related, inversely related. So directly proportional or, in, or inversely proportional. All of these all of these variables are. So we're going to learn about three or four gas laws as we deal with that. So the first one is called Boyle's law, and in Boyle's law <coughs> relates two of the uh, gas law variables, and will hold the other two constant. So so for Boyle's law, we're relating pressure. How pressure changes affect the volume, and we're going to assume temperature is constant and amount is constant. So if the pressure of a gas is increased, the volume must decrease to accommodate that pressure increase, assuming the temperature and amount of the gas is constant. Um, so what we what we call this is inversely related. Pressure and volume are inversely related. And this is, this is the mathematical definition of Boyle's Law. P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. And what, what this means, what P1 means, and V1 is just the first condition. So in the initial conditions, you know, might know the pressure of a gas is 0.8 atmosphere, and the volume of that gas is 2 liters. And we know that if we put that gas, we, we put it into a uh, bigger volume. Say we, we made the volume go bigger, what would happen to the pressure? Bigger volume means lower pressure. They're inversely related. And that second condition is what the new pressure and volume would be. So we're going to do some problems with Boyle's Law, how you, how you use this to solve problems. If you think on a, that is a YouTube link if you want to Copy and paste that. You can. I won't show it on this. But if you think on a molecular level, why this works, 
you have the gas molecules impacting the surface of a container with a certain force, and that's the pressure. Well, if you increase the volume, it's going to take longer for those gas molecules to get to the surface, so that would mean the pressure would decrease. They're just not hitting as often. And just the opposite, if you decrease the volume, the gas molecules are going to be able to hit the walls of the container more frequently, and then therefore the pressure would go up. So that's what's happening on a molecular level. Molecules in a smaller space will collide more, fre more frequently with each other and the container. Therefore, as the volume decreases, the pressure goes up. And just the opposite, if the volume increases, the pressure goes down. So that's Boyle's Law. This is a picture of Boyle's Law. You have two conditions. This, this one would be the first condition, one, and this would be the second condition, two. Um, so you, you've got a, a given pressure, whatever, we're just looking at a relative um, change. So here's a pressure with a given volume. If you decrease the volume, as we do in the second condition, these molecules are hitting more frequently, and therefore the pressure goes up. Now what we're holding constant in Boyle's Law is the temperature of the gas. We're not changing the temperature of the gas, and we're not changing the amount of the gas. The number of gas molecules in both conditions is the same, or constant. So that's a picture of, of Boyle's Law. So here's a, here's a bright slide. A scuba diver carries a 1.5 liter sealed plastic bottle from the surface where the pressure is one atmosphere to a depth of 90 feet. Where the pressure is going to be 3.7 atmospheres. The bottle compresses the watt final volume. Okay, so when you're working these kinds of problems, it is, let, let me, uh, Raise the screen and I'll and I'll uh, start working the problem. So hold on just a second. Okay. So what you need to do for these gas law problems is write down all the variables when you punch them in the problem. So as you read this, the scuba diver carries a 1.5 liter sealed plastic container. So gosh, I'm going to write V is equal to 1.5 liter plastic bottle, and obviously the bottle is empty because we're dealing with gases, where the pressure is one atmosphere. Okay, now what? So it goes down to a depth of 90 feet where the pressure is 3.7 atmospheres. Oh my gosh, we have another pressure condition. So I'm going to say initially this was the volume and the pressure. The second condition, the pressure changes to 3.7 atmospheres, and the question is asking, what is the new volume? That is the, that's what the question is asking. So we would use Boyle's Law to solve this problem. If you remember Boyle's Law, the equation was P1, V1 is equal to P2, V2. And we want to solve for V2, so we're, we divide both sides by P2. And I'll rearrange the equation, so P2 cancels out. V2 then is equal to V1 times P1 over P2. And now we just need to plug in the things that we've defined as V1, P1, and P2, and we'll get the second volume. So V1 is 1.5 liters times P1 was one atmosphere. And we divide by P2, which was 3.7 atmospheres. And notice our units work out, atmosphere cancels out, and we're left with units of volume. So V2 then is going to be equal to 1.5 times 1 divided by 3.7. And that is equal to, let me uh, go to the next slide and we'll see what it's equal to.
well, I guess I don't have what it's equal to on the, well, I don't have what it's equal to on the next slide. So anyway, you can plug those values in and, and see what that's equal to. Here's, a, here's another quiz question. What factor must the pressure change in order to decrease the volume of the gas from 10 liters to 5 liters? Assume the temperature and amount are constant. So because temperature is constant and amount is constant, we're dealing with Boyle's law. So if we want to uh, half the volume essentially, what factor must we increase the pressure? So pause the video and I'll, I'll tell you the answer here in the next slide. The answer is you must increase the pressure by a factor of two if you want to half the volume. Okay, so just reiterating. What is uh, what is held constant or what is held constant in Boyle's law? In addition to the amount of gas, Boyle's law holds which of the gas variables constant? No amount is constant, and temperature is constant. So in Boyle's law, we compare pressure and volume, how they're related. They're inversely related. Okay, so that's Boyle's law. Here's a here's a picture of scuba divers and how an increase in pressure as you go down in the water affects the gases in your bodies. This is one of the huge things that, that divers learn when they're certifying is how to handle the effect of the, the higher pressures on the gases that are in their body, in their ears, in their lungs, um, and how the gases affect or absorbed into bloodstream, all that kind of stuff. So here's a person with an atmospheric pressure of two atmospheres versus at the surface, they'd be at one atmosphere. Obviously, their, their lungs are going to be under pressure. The lung volume decreases. The, the volume of the, of the air inside their ears decreases. That's what gives you the extreme pain in your ear, in your eardrum, because the volume is decreasing as the pressure increases. So one more Boyle's Law question. According to Boyle's Law, if pressure is decreased by a factor of five, then what does the volume do? What would be the inverse relationship of that? Well, hopefully it's obvious that the volume would be increased by a factor of five if uh, the pressure is decreased by a factor of five. Okay. So the next thing we need to talk about is, is what's happening on a molecular level um, with these gases. <clears throat> the atoms and molecules that make up gases are in constant motion and they travel in a straight line until they bump into something like another molecule or the wall of the container. When, when the temperature of a gas increases, what does that mean? What's happening to the molecules if the temperature increases? What is temperature? Well, that's a really good question. And we need to understand what temperature is and how it affects gases to talk about the next gas law. So essentially, if, if all temperature is, really, the bottom line, is it's a function of the kinetic energy or the energy of movement of the molecules that you're measuring the temperature of. So if, some, if a gas sample has a higher temperature, it means the gas molecules are moving faster. They have more kinetic energy. And as they're moving faster, the bottom, the bottom sentence in blue, as molecules absorb heat, or they, they get heated up, they are moving faster, therefore they're going to strike the surface that they collide with with greater force. So what does that do to the pressure then? If the molecules are increasing 
their velocity, they're going to have a, an impact that's greater. Therefore, the pressure will increase. So temperature, as I mentioned before, is it's a function of the kinetic energy of a sample of gas. The higher the temperature, the more kinetic energy. The lower the temperature, the less kinetic energy. And there are different temperature scales. This is not by far not the only scales that are used. There are other scales that are used for different things. But these are the most common. In the US, we use a temperature scale called Fahrenheit. Um, everywhere else in the world, pretty much, uses Celsius or centigrade. In science, we use Kelvin and, and Celsius. Both are, both are used. But Kelvin actually is the base unit for the international system of units. It's in Kelvin. And when you're talking about temperature, we say degree Fahrenheit, degree Celsius, but we don't say degree Kelvin. To say, oh, the temperature of the gas is 100 Kelvins. Uh, you don't say degree Kelvins because then everybody knows that you're not a, a scientist. So you want people to think, to know you're a scientist. Anyway, the, these equations that are on this slide um, are how you convert between the, the different temperature scales. And I would expect you to be able to convert between the temperature scales on the next exam. Um, I will give you these formulas. You don't need to memorize them, but you need to know how to use them and what these different temperature scales mean. So here's some thermometers just with the different temperature scales. Um, here are some reference points. Absolute zero here on the on this zero Kelvin is called absolute zero. And what that is, absolute zero, is where there is no more molecular motion, where there where the atoms stop moving. Absolute zero is well, minus 273 degrees C and minus 459 degrees Fahrenheit. You can see as you go across the scale what they're equal to. Um, absolute zero is important because this is the scale that we use for the gas laws. If you don't use Kelvin for the gas laws if in your, your temperature scale, you're going to mess up your problem. So remember to always use Kelvin. Here's some other um, water or water freezes, zero degrees C. You just add 273 to that, and that's the Kelvin, 273 Kelvin is zero degrees C. And you can, there's the water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And here's the boiling point, 100 degrees C. Just add 273 to get into the Kelvin scale, and 212 to Fahrenheit using that Fahrenheit conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit. So the reason we need to talk about temperature is because the next gas law called Charles Law has temperature as one of the variables that can change. In Boyle's Law, temperature is held constant, so we didn't need to worry about it. But for Charles Law, we do need to worry about it. So the very first sentence on this slide, if the temperature of gas is increased at constant pressure, what happens to its volume? So in Charles Law, we're holding the pressure constant. We're, we're able to use a uh, container that will allow a constant pressure. And I'll, I'll give you an example of, of what this is in just a minute. But anyway, so we're holding amount constant and pressure constant. We're just relating the two variables of volume and temperature. So if you can if you can think in terms of what the molecules, if if the pressure, if the force that the gas molecules are hitting the walls of the container is constant and you increase the temperature of that gas, you better make the, the volume bigger so the pressure remains constant. We call that a directly related relationship where volume and temperature are directly related. 
Um, and Charles' law in, in equation form is V1 divided by T1 is equal to V2 divided by T2. Or again, we're comparing a gas at two different conditions, holding pressure and amount constant. So if you think on a molecular level, that's what's happening is molecules absorb heat. They're going to strike with more force. So in order to keep the force the same, the volume must increase to, to keep that constant pressure. So that's Charles' law. So again, to reiterate in Charles' law, what are we holding constant? We're holding the amount constant, and what is the other term that did not appear in that equation? It is pressure, we're holding pressure. Amount and pressure are constant. So, one of the biggest things that students do in solving these gas law problems wrong, one of the most common errors is that they forget to convert the temperature into Kelvin. You've got to have it in Kelvin or you'll miss the problem. So I'm just warning you, and I promise you on the next exam there will be a problem that if you forget to change into the Kelvin scale, you'll get the problem wrong. So for gas laws, the temperature must always be in Kelvin. So this is a picture of, of uh, Charles Law. How, how is this a constant pressure? Let me just explain how, how this is a constant pressure condition. So here we have, on the left, we have, a, we have a syringe that's in some ice water. Now the syringe has a plunger that has pressure pushing down on it. It's got at the atmosphere pressure pushing down on it. And that's a constant force, isn't it? The pressure is constantly with the same amount pushing down on that, on that syringe. Well, the gas inside the syringe is pushing back with exactly the same force as the pressure pushing down on the syringe. So the pressure inside here and the pressure outside are equal. And so because this syringe can go up and down, it's going to, and this is constant pressure, this is a constant pressure environment. Now you can see that when the gas molecules are putting ice water, the volume is quite small. If you put that same syringe with the same amount of gas in it, put it in some hot water, the volume is going to increase. Now the pressure is the same inside because the pressure is constant outside. It's going to be the same inside. So the pressure is constant. The amount of gas is constant, and you can see that as the temperature increased in the second condition, the volume also increased. So volume and temperature are directly related. That's called Charles' law. So let's do an example. A hot air balloon has a volume of that many cubic meters at 60 degrees. What is its volume at 20 degrees? Here's the answer. I hopefully calculated that correctly, but let me uh, show you how. Pause the video and see if you can solve the problem, and then I will then I will work the problem. All right. First of all, what you need to do for these gas law problems is write down everything that you come to. So as I read the problem, V1 is equal to 643 cubic meters. And the T1 is equal to 60 degrees C. So what is its volume? Oh my gosh, here's the second volume. So V2 is what I don't know. What is its volume at the new temperature of 20 degrees C? Okay, so when you, when you think about this, you can predict what will happen. What, what do you think will happen to the size of the balloon as the temperature decreases? The pressure is constant. The atmospheric pressure pushing on that balloon is constant. So you know the amount of the balloon and the amount of the air in the balloon and the pressure is constant. So we can use Charles' law, which is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. 
Okay, so I would predict that we should get a smaller volume um, because the temperature decreases. So if we solve for V2, we're going to multiply both sides by T2. So V2 is going to be equal to V1 times T2 over T1. We plug these things in. What do we have to do about the temperature though? Hopefully you remember that we need to add 273 to both of these. So this is 333 Kelvin, and we add 273 to this one, and that is 293 Kelvin. So we've got to use these Kelvins in this problem. So V1 is 643 cubic meters, and I'm going to run into into myself, let me erase that. So V1 is equal to 643 cubic meters. T2 is 293 Kelvin. And divided by T1, which was 333 Kelvin. So Kelvin cancels out and we're left with volume of cubic meter. And so when you plug those numbers in your calculator, hopefully I get it right and we get an answer that is smaller than our initial volume so that makes us feel confident in our ability to get the problem right. Okay, so uh, another <coughs> quiz question. I just want to reiter reiterate how important it is to use the uh, correct temperature scale so when you're using these gas laws, if temperature is in the equation, you have to use which one? The answer is Kelvin. Okay, so here's, a, here's another problem for you to work on. Um, pause the video and see if you can solve this problem. And I'm going to turn the video back on and, and I'll show you how to work it with the right answer. Okay, I'm going to, I'm going to write down everything that's in this problem. So a sample of gas at, ten, at 10 degrees C. So P1 is equal to 10 degrees C. I better add 273 to that right now because I know I'll need to has a volume of 300 milliliters. So V1 is equal to 300 milliliters. And it does say a pressure, P1 is one atmosphere. And if we, uh, what is the volume of the gas? Oh my gosh, here I, I don't know what the volume is gonna be. The temperature is gonna change to 30 degrees C. I better add 273 to that to get it into Kelvin. And the pressure is one atmosphere. Okay, so I've listed everything that's in this problem. Notice something about this, that these pressures are the same. Pressure is constant. And this problem didn't say anything about adding or, or adding more gas or taking away some of the gas, so the amount is also constant. When these two conditions are met, then we use Charles' Law. Charles' Law is V1 over T1 is equal to V2 over T2. We're solving for V2 again. So V2 is equal to V1 over T1 times T2, plugging those things in, we got to make sure that we have the right temperature scale, 300 milliliters times T, uh oh, look, I did a mistake, this is T2. So T2 goes on top, that's going to be 303 Kelvin. And divided by T1, which was 283 Kelvin. 
So we'll take 300 divided by 283 times 303. So because the temperature goes up, you'd expect the volume to be a little bit higher. And indeed, if you did the calculation right, and I'll show you what the answer is on the next slide, the volume did increase. So the answer is 321 milliliters. If you did this problem wrong, and by not converting into Kelvin, you're going to get a sub substantially different answer than 321 milliliters. So if you made the mistake of not converting to Kelvin, you would get the problem wrong, and your answer would not only be a little off, it would be way off. So remember, you gotta convert to Kelvin. So putting all these gas laws together into what we call a combined gas law is the next thing. Um, so the combined gas law is just putting all of these laws, like I said, together. Charles law, Boyle's law, the pressure temperature law that we didn't really talk about, but I kind of mentioned that with the pressure cooker that obeys the pressure temperature law, holding the volume constant what happens to the pressure as you increase the temperature. Uh, and there's some other laws that we, we can use, but they're all kind of embodied in this combined gas law. <clears throat> and uh, let me write down the formula for the combined gas law, and then we'll solve this problem. So. Um, in, order to, in order to solve this problem, you have to figure out which gas law to use. And so I will let's stop the video for a minute and I will start solving this problem. You can start solving the problem using the combined gas law. And the combined gas law is P1 times V1 divided by T2 is equal to P2 times V2 divided by T2. So you just put all those, both those two laws together and you get the combined gas law. If you, if you look right here, here's the combined gas law solving for V2, which is this problem in the textbook you solve for V2. So anyway, let's, uh, let me raise the slide, erase the screen and start solving this problem. Okay. Let me first of all write um, the combined gas law. Combined gas law is P1, V1 divided by P1 is equal to P2, V2 divided by T2. Okay, so when you're reading a problem, we need to uh, just write down everything that's given in the problem. The backpacker carries an empty 0.50 liter collapsible water container. Okay, so here's my first thing, volume. V1 is 0 0.50 liter. Into the mountains, the initial conditions were one atmosphere. Okay, so initially, the pressure is one atmosphere. The temperature is equal to 23 C. I'm gonna add 273 to that right now because I know I'm going to have to have it in Kelvin. So the pressure in, at the summit, the new pressure, P2 is equal to 0 0.83 atmospheres. The new temperature, you can't see what that is, 30 degrees C, plus 273. And we want to know what V2, it seems like we're always solving for V2, solving for V2, that won't be the case necessarily in all the questions you have to solve, but just coincidentally we're solving for V2 and everything. So why are we not using Charles' law for this? Well, Charles' law can't be used because the, the pressure's changing. Why can't we use Boyle's law? Well, Boyle's law requires the temperature to be held constant, and the temperature is not constant, so we can't use Boyle's law for this problem. So we have to combine those gas laws together, and in the combined gas law, we can use this. 
if the thing that is being held constant is still amount, still n or amount, remember n is moles, amount is constant. So we're, we have essentially sealed containers that um, that the gas isn't entering or escaping. So I'm going to put this, set this up, and I'll raise the screen a little bit more, and then okay. So solving for this, um, solving for V2. Let me show you algebraically. Here's the combined gas law. Solving for V2, so I need to multiply both sides by T2. That crosses out and divide both sides by P2. And that cancels out. So we're happy we have V2 is equal to that big, those five variables. So we plug those in, V2 is going to be equal to T2, which is 303 Kelvin. P1, you gotta keep track of what you're doing, make sure you label label everything. The V1 was the half a liter divided by P2, which is the second pressure, and also divided by T1, which is the first temperature, which is 293 Kelvin. And you can think about this. What do you think is going to happen to that container as the pressure goes up? What will happen to the uh, not as the pressure goes up, as the pressure goes down, the pressure decreases. What should happen to the volume? Well, as pressure decreases, volume will increase. So we'd expect the volume to be bigger from the pressure decrease. And as the temperature increases, that also will affect the, the volume make the volume bigger. So both of those effects of increasing temperature and decreasing pressure will make the volume be bigger for this collapsible bottle. And indeed, if you solve that, uh, you'll see that the, the volume is bigger. I don't, we'll see what the actual number is on the next slide. And notice how all the units work out. Kelvin cancels out, atmosphere cancels out, and we're left with volume of liter, which is what we want. Okay, so the answer after we solve it is 0.67 liters. So the volume did increase as we predicted it. Okay, one more gas law called the ideal gas law. And this was, our book doesn't even talk about the ideal gas law, but I think it's important enough and easy enough to learn you know, just by me describing it. There will be some problems on the sapling homework that you will need to do with the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is important because if you look at it, here, here it is, PV equal NRT. It's probably the most famous gas law, more than Charles and Boyle's, because it actually has amount in it, which, you know, in chemistry we're always asking about amount. What's the amount of this? What's the amount of that? So, pressure, volume, amount, and temperature. If you if you rearrange that and had solve for R, which is called the gas constant, um, we have the combined gas law: P times V divided by T divided by N. They're equal to a constant. So really, the, the ideal gas law is really the combined gas law if we just have a defined constant that all those things are equal to. So this is the kind of, of problem that you can solve using the ideal gas law. How many moles of the gas are found in a balloon that has a volume of 0.5 liter, a pressure of 1.6 atmospheres, and a temperature of 25 degrees C? Well, that is a more interesting question because it's asking how many moles. And if you can measure the temperature and the pressure and the volume, you can get moles. And so if you know 
there's essentially four variables in the in the Idaho gas law. If you know three of them, you can figure out the fourth. R is given at 0.0821, then the units on R are liters times atmosphere divided by K times mole. Okay, so these units dictate what the, what these things have to be in. All the other gas laws, we didn't I didn't say, oh, the pressure's got to be in atmospheres and the volume's got to be in liters. I didn't say that. The only unit that was required was temperature being in Kelvin. <clears throat> but for the idle gas law, that R value tells you what everything has to be in. So you need to make sure that when you're solving these problems, if the pressure is given in something else, like four, you'll need to convert that into atmospheres before you solve the problem. So for this problem, though, it's pretty straightforward because the volume is given in liters, the pressure in atmospheres, and the temperature needs to be converted to Kelvin. But other than that, it's, we're good to go. So I want you to pause, pause the video for a minute and see if you can work this using the Idaho gas law, and uh, I'll show you how to do it. And there's the answer there for you. Okay, again, listing all the variables. Um, how many moles? So I, wanted, I want to know what moles is. What do I know? I know the volume of that is 0.5 liters. The pressure is equal to 1.6 atmosphere. And the temperature is 25 degrees C. I better add 273 to that to, uh, to make sure that I do it correctly. So what's the other thing that we know? Well, we know R. R is given to us. R is equal to 0 0.0821, and the units on that is liter times atmosphere over K times mole. Okay, so this, this problem doesn't say, oh, the pressure change or the temperature change. It gives you one set of conditions and asks, about one of the variables. That's how you know you want to use the idle gas law. So if we solve for N, N is equal to pressure times volume over R divided by T. If we put in pressure is 1.6 atmospheres times the volume, which was 0 0.5 liters, divided by R, 0.0821, units are liter atmosphere over K times mole. It's kind of a pain to write those, but you need to do it to make the units, make sure the units work out. And temperature was 298 Kelvin. And I got that by adding 25 degrees to 273. So there you go. There's, there's how you figure out how many moles. I want you to know how many moles, if you knew the identity of the gas, you could find out how many grams were in that balloon, you could do all sorts of other calculations. So this is the ideal gas law. Make sure you do the sapling homework that tells you how and it will give you practice. There isn't any practice in the textbook, but I thought it was valuable for you to know that. Okay, this question is kind of a culmination question that brings a lot of concepts uh, that we've done before and brings them all together. Um, to solve a problem of a, of a combustion problem. Now we can use the ideal gas law to solve this problem. So this question is asking how many liters of oxygen are needed to combust with exactly 27.8 grams of methane at STP. STP is kind of a, a standard, it means standard temperature and pressure. 
and that's defined as zero degrees C and one atmosphere. So on the sapling, it might give you that STP, and, you, and they expect you to know that pressure means one atmosphere, temperature is zero degrees C. So, um, oh, let me turn the lights off so you can see better. Okay, so this question is, first of all, write a balanced combustion reaction. And then, once you know the combustion reaction, you can actually, if you know the amount of methane, you can actually figure out how many moles of oxygen. So that would be the next thing to do. And once you know moles of oxygen, how can you figure out the volume of oxygen required? Because we know oxygen is a gas, how can we figure out um, the volume of the gas at STP conditions? So I would stop the video now and see if you can see if you can work this and then turn the video back on and I'll and I'll show you how to do excuse me how to do this problem. Now, 
four seven five mole of O2. Well, I want to know volume. This is looking an awful lot like a gas law, ideal gas law problem. Because I know R, I always know R, that's 0 0.0821 meter atmosphere over K times mole. So it looks like if I use PV equals NRT, I know pressure, I know N, I know R, I know T, I can solve for V, V is going to be equal to NRT over P. So now I just plug in everything that I figured out in the problem. <laughs> so V is going to be equal to 3.475 mole times 0 0.0821 liter atmosphere over K times mole times temperature, which is 273 Kelvin, all divided by the pressure of one atmosphere. So there we go, all the units cancel out, mole cancels out here, Kelvin cancels out here, atmosphere cancels out like that, leaving us units of volume, which is what we want. So after all that work, we get a volume of 77.9 liters. In order to react with 27.8 grams of methane, you would need that volume of oxygen gas to completely react with that. So that is, that's kind of a, a culmination problem that brings a lot of concepts together, which if this was easy for you, or doable, then yay, good job. If not, we need to study a little bit harder. Okay, so there, oh, let me turn the lights off. So the answer to this, we, I just showed you, so this is kind of silly, that it's number three. 77.9 meters. Okay, well, let's see what's next. We've covered pretty much all of the um, gas law problems, all the calculations <laughs> that you need to be able to do for this chapter. The rest of the chapter is some um, concerns for gases and for uh, just about gas-based pollutants and that kinds of things. So let's let's continue on. Which component is not typically found in the combustion or composition of the air we breathe? How do you think? So pause the video and uh, see if you can figure out the answer. Yeah, chlorine gas is the answer. Boy, we, we don't want to be breathing chlorine gas. Chlorine gas will will kill us in high enough concentrations, so we want to make sure that we don't breathe chlorine gas. Um, there is a little bit of naturally occurring chlorine gas generated like in some ocean chemistry, a little bit. it's so reactive that it doesn't stay in the atmosphere very long to cause a problem. But all the other things are, are natural components of the air that we breathe. That here, here are all of these um, this is a, from our textbook. By far the biggest component is nitrogen at 78%, followed by oxygen. Argon, which is, a, which is a noble gas, is the third most abundant component of the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide, fourth. This column in the middle is part per million, and, and oftentimes you'll, you'll, they'll, they'll tell you the part per million of carbon dioxide and it, it does refer to the percent. So 350 part per million would be 0.035 percent. This number is what has scientists really concerned as this number goes up because more people are burning fossil fuels or more fossil fuels are being burned. The carbon dioxide concentration increases, which increases the effect of a, of a greenhouse gas. And we'll talk more about that.
nitrogen. Nitrogen. Some things that are interesting about nitrogen. It is inert. It. It's a good thing our atmosphere is mostly made out of nitrogen because it doesn't react with anything. Um, tasteless, colorless, non-flammable, inert. Um, but the interesting thing about nitrogen is that everything alive needs nitrogen in order to stay alive. So here we are bathed in an atmosphere rich in nitrogen, but we can't use and to nor can plants or other animals. And so how nature has come up with a way to, to uh, get nitrogen in a useful form is by bacteria that can break that nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond and get the nitrogen into a form <coughs> that's usable to plants and animals. In the 19 Hundreds, a couple German scientists actually came up with a way to create ammonia, which is essentially making reacting nitrogen with hydrogen to form ammonia. And once that process to artificially break that nitrogen triple bond was created, boy, the world changed. Um, we could have an unlimited amount of fertilizer explosives and all this kind of stuff, all, all because of a couple German scientists in the early 1900s figuring out how to do what nature required bacteria to do. It's called the Haber-Bosch um, system. You can, you can look up about the Haber-Bosch system and how that changed the world as we know it. Oxygen is very reactive. Our, our, the oxygen our, in our atmosphere is necessary and it's it's for life as we know it. And it's a good thing our atmosphere is only about 20% because if our if our atmosphere was higher than 20% oxygen, our lifespans would actually decrease. Oxygen is so reactive that in too rich of an oxygen environment, our cells break down, our nasal membranes and lungs would be damaged just by having too much oxygen. So our atmosphere has just the right amount of oxygen. Oxygen is used in combustion, as we know, and rusting. It's just, you know, pretty much the oxygen in our atmosphere drives the chemistry for life as we know it. The carbon dioxide is essential for plants. It's carbon dioxide is a reactive for plants. Carbon dioxide is a product for animals and people. So carbon dioxide is our waste product that it's necessary for plants in order to, to, to do the photosynthesis. Um, so we have a really good cycle of plants needing carbon dioxide and us exhaling carbon dioxide. The problem is in the Industrial Revolution, people figured out that they can burn coal make energy. And once that happened, then the natural cycle of CO2 and O2 was, was disrupted in a, in a horrific way for our planet's future. Um, it's a, it's carbon dioxide is one of the main products of combustion. In environmental chemistry, we talk about sources and we talk about sinks. A source of carbon dioxide would be fossil fuel combustion. One of the biggest sinks, or where the carbon dioxide goes to, is the oceans. The oceans absorb a huge, vast amount of carbon dioxide, and it gets incorporated into um, the water chemistry that is in the ocean, and it can precipitate as calcium carbonate as, and have long-term permanent fixed calcium carbonate. So the oceans are really important as far as this carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide cycle goes. Some of the other, the argon, neon, and helium are trace gases. They are noble gases, but they are found in the atmosphere. And they're chemically unreactive. <laughs> Let's talk for a few minutes about the, the atmosphere. This, this part of the chapter in the textbook is going to deal with some pollutants in our atmosphere. 
and, and to me, this is the most important type of chemistry because, boy, I tell you, if you don't have clean air, it, it's just it's just not good. And we live in, a, in an area where the air in the winter is really really bad. We'll talk about some of those some of those issues. But here is the atmosphere. We live in the troposphere. The, the part closest to the ground is called the troposphere, and it goes up about 10 kilometers or about, I don't know, what is that, 8 miles? That's where pretty much all the chemistry happens, where all the weather is. It's just so important. Um, the next layer is, is the stratosphere. That is a hugely important layer for one main reason, is that is where stratosphere and ozone is found, which protects the Earth's surface from harmful ultraviolet radiation. The mesosphere and ionosphere are thinner and thinner. There's, you know, essentially you're almost getting to the vacuum of space as you go up into the ionosphere. But the mesosphere, there's enough gases there that you begin to see shooting stars. Um, in the ionosphere, there's enough gases there that they can it reacts with some of the cosmic radiation coming from our sun and other places, and that's where colors that are found in the aurora borealis and the aurora australis are found in the ionosphere, way high up, and there's not very much gas. So we're mostly going to focus on the troposphere. Um, this is just seeing if you're paying attention the last two minutes. The answer is the stratosphere, the protective layer of ozone. So I'll go through this pretty quickly. You can read about what's in our in the, in the book, but the troposphere is the interesting part, at least in my mind, because that's where all the chemistry happens, where all life exists, um, where all the weather occurs. If ozone is present in the troposphere, it is really, really bad because ozone is very, very reactive, and and it is it is a pollutant. If you have, if you live in an area where there is photochemical smog, like Mexico City or Los Angeles, the ozone concentrations can be so damaging to people's health. Uh, it's a really big concern. So, ozone is a pollutant that happens in tropospheric chemistry. We don't like it here. We do like it in the stratosphere. In the stratosphere. That's where the ozone is that we like, and it's necessary there. If ozone isn't there, our plants wouldn't be able to live like they do. We would have increased risk of skin cancer. There'd be all sorts of really bad issues if the ozone layer was, was gone. <clears throat> I'm just going to talk about these pollutants just, just for a little bit because these are pollutants that, that our government in, in, with the EPA has determined can be very, very bad for human health. These are called the criteria pollutants, so the main ones that we need to watch out for in, in tropospheric air. And we'll, I'll go through each one of these. This graph is just telling you that, that in, I'm not, not sure what year, these were the standards that people shouldn't exceed in their in their atmosphere, in their air where they live. So we'll go through each one of these for a few minutes. Most of these pollutants are a result of fossil fuel combustion. So boy, I tell you, fossil fuel really has wreaked havoc on our planet. Um, so SO2, sulfur dioxide. The problems with sulfur dioxide It is a contributor to acid rain, which can destroy forests and lakes. Can, uh, acid rain can dissolve statues, marble statues. Uh, it also can form particulate matter, that PM10 or PM2.5. That PM stands for particulate matter that's really small in diameter. And PM10 and 2.5 are, are something that's more and more important to not be exposed to. The what happens with PM10 and PM2.5 can be very damaging to people, especially 
heart and lung, respiratory illness, and heart disease. But SO2 is a precursor to that, emitted from coal, burning power plants, and smelters. The PM 2.5 is, is the one that's really being focused on now. And what it means is it's particles that are very, very small, about 2.5 micrometers or microns. A human hair is about 100 microns. So these particles, you can't even see them with your, with your naked eye. Uh, and they're so small that they can get deep into the lungs when they can cause all sorts of problems and have some inflammatory responses in our, in our bodies. Um, they originate from secondary chemical processes SO2 or nitrates in the air reacting to form the particular matter. So these are this is a really big concern and, and Utah County is a really bad place to be in the winter because of the particular matter that's formed from the inversion during the inversion <laughs> the inversions that happen. So here's the, some of the problems with PM 2.5 heart and respiratory problems. We also can lower visibility and scenic distance visibility degradation is, is, is affected by these small particles. And so there's a lot of concerns with particular matter. Mostly in the news we hear about the heart and the health problems of PM10. Um, carbon dioxide, boy, that's not good to be exposed to. It, it essentially binds to the hemoglobin in the blood more strongly than the oxygen. And so it diminishes your blood's capability to carry oxygen. Um, when that happens, your brain activity is impaired and it can kill you. And, uh, it's, just a, it's a really bad thing to be exposed to. Carbon monoxide is always present whenever you have any combustion. Some of the combustion doesn't happen perfectly and you're exposed to carbon monoxide. Ozone is part of photochemical smog, like I mentioned. And essentially, the ingredients of photochemical smog are unburned hydrocarbons coming out of car exhaust or from evaporation of gasoline, and sunlight and nitrogen oxides. And, and what you'll get is a murky soup with ozone in it that is just so bad for you. It's really bad for, for young people. It impairs lung function children or asthmatics, people that are at risk are really susceptible to having ozone damage in their lungs, and healthy people too, for that matter. <clears throat> NO2 is a problem because it also occurs when combustion happens. And it is one of the ingredients for photochemical smog and acid rain. So NO2 is one of the pollutants that we keep our eye on because it is an ingredient for so many other bad things. If you go into the Los Angeles basin, you'll see this brown, brown color haze. Well, that brown color comes from NO2, from all the combustion that's going on. And it, it is really one of the ingredients that is so bad because it makes particulate matter and actually ozone. So NO2 is just a bad, bad, bad pollutant in the atmosphere. Lead is something you don't want to be exposed to. Um, it's, it used to be an additive in gasoline, but that was outlawed in the 90s, luckily, because you know lead worked really great in combustion engines, but unfortunately, it would come out the tailpipe and get into the soil, and, and, and people could be exposed to, to lead, which anytime you're exposed to lead, it's a bad time, because it, it, it impairs your neurological functions, your kidneys, your liver, it's toxic. And so luckily lead was outlawed for automobiles. It still could be emitted from smokers and battery plants. And you know, maybe uh, you could have thought copper mine might have some lead emissions just any time they're smoking. Carbon dioxide is a problem because it is a greenhouse gas. And every time you burn fossil fuel, you emit carbon dioxide into the air, and that, that is the biggest source. The biggest sink is the oceans, like I mentioned before. 
the biggest problem with CO2, it doesn't, I mean, we, we exhale CO2, it doesn't hurt us physically, but what it does is increases the greenhouse effect, which means the temperature of the air in our troposphere increases. And as the temperature of the air increases, the global temperature of waters also increase. And we have a phenomenon called global warming. In 1970, the government enacted a Clean Air Act that regulated emissions for these criteria pollutants. In 1990, there were, were, was really the big deal as far as the Clean Air Act because not only did they make amendments to it, but they actually put um, punishments if people didn't get their act together and obey the Clean Air Act um, levels for pollutants. So as a result of the Clean Air Act, our air is so much better than it used to be as, as a nation. Um, the technology for vehicle combustion is so much better. Number one, number one thing that we should would do is get rid of all the old cars and, and have these new cars that have better uh, pollution control technology. Um, that, that really goes a long way to increase um, our air quality. So here's a good question. Which of these is not associated with the motor vehicle exhaust for gasoline engines? Well, think about this, pause the video. sulfur dioxide. All the other things actually are associated with motor vehicle exhaust, um, including lead because it used to be an additive and you can still take soil samples from nearby highways or freeways and get detectable levels of lead from the exhaust of cars 20, 30, 40 years ago. So lead is associated with motor vehicle exhaust because it used to be an additive it's very persistent in the environment when it, when it is emitted. So which are, which are the pollutants that are still a problem? This graph from the textbook kind of shows you that lead really decreased 94% of emissions. So lead really got taken care of. Um, not so much the PM10, PM2.5, ozone, and the NO2. These, these graphs show you that these have shown improvement, but these really got better. These SO2, by picking up SO2 from uh, coal-fired power plants, using scrubbers, that was really helped a lot, or having low sulfur diesel. Uh, carbon monoxide was decreased just from having better um, catalytic, catalytic converters on vehicles. The lead was just pretty much removed from gasoline, and that really solved the majority of the problem. So let's talk about global warming for a few minutes, and then we'll talk about the ozone hole, and then we'll be done with uh, this chapter. So this picture shows how a greenhouse gas works. As sunlight comes down, it goes through glass, the wavelength becomes longer, and it bounces around in here and heats up the air in a greenhouse. Well, the same thing kind of happens in our Earth's atmosphere. Our Earth's atmosphere contains many greenhouse gases, not just carbon dioxide, methane. Um, the number one greenhouse gas is actually gas phase water molecules. We like that our planet has greenhouse gases because if it didn't, if we didn't have an atmosphere that had those gases in it, we wouldn't be able to have life on Earth. You look at the other planets in our solar system that don't have greenhouse gases, their atmospheres are uninhabitable, essentially. And so, you know, the greenhouse gases are our friends. It makes the atmosphere just the right temperature for life as we know it to exist. And how, how these greenhouse gases work is that certain molecules can absorb radiation that comes in from the atmosphere. They absorb it by, you know, their bonds will vibrate or shake or rotate, and they absorb it 
if their bonds are just right, then they'll re-emit a longer wavelength of light. So it takes higher, higher energy, lower, smaller wavelength light, and makes it into longer light wavelengths. It actually essentially traps heat inside our atmosphere. Therefore, we have a greenhouse effect because of these greenhouse gases. And so this is a natural carbon cycle. Um, down here, it talks about the, uh, it shows how the CO2, this is a big sink for the CO2. The, the ocean is by far the biggest sink for the CO2, but the rest, the rest of it, you know, is pretty much cyclical, you know, respiration, decomposition, uh, and that's opposite of photosynthesis. You can have fires that, that burn trees, or a tree can die and re-emit the CO2. So this is just a cycle, a, a global carbon cycle. Now, we interrupted that normal cycle by starting to burn fossil fuels like crazy about 120, 30 years ago. Um, this graph kind of shows how the concentration of CO2 is increasing. And this, this is taken from ice core data. You can actually, scientists can actually get ice cores and get the CO2 that's trapped in the ice core. And if they know how the ice core is, they know what the CO2 level was at that particular year. And so you can see that the Industrial Revolution really started to kick in in the mid 1800s, and it started ramping up at the turn of the century. And just you use more and more people using more and more fossil fuel. And here we are in the 1960s. The much much better data in the 1960s. They didn't need to use ice core data. And this is kind of interesting. You've got the the up and down peaks here, and that just shows how trees getting tree getting leaves uh, makes the carbon dioxide level go way down, and then as the trees stop uptaking carbon dioxide to make leaves, the concentration goes up. So that's why it's squiggly like that. But the general trend is up. And we are pushing 400 part per million um, of CO2, which is a really high value. There are some people that say, oh, the Earth's warming is just a natural cycle. But you can't ignore the fact that if you increase the concentration of something that has an effect, that effect will be increased. You can't argue that logic because we are increasing the concentration of carbon dioxide and it is a greenhouse gas, therefore the effect of carbon dioxide must be increasing the greenhouse effect. Now granted there are other cycles that the Earth goes through that, that just the distance from the sun can affect temperature. Or the, the angle of the Earth's of the Earth's poles relative to the sun can affect things, but we still need to err on the side of caution, saying that our input of carbon dioxide unnaturally over the past 130 years has caused an effect of increasing our global temperature. It is a very difficult problem because people like to use cars, they like to have electricity by coal-fired power plants. It's very difficult to uh, to take care of the CO2. How do you get rid of CO2? It, it's very inert. It doesn't react with anything really. Once it's CO2, it just stays in the atmosphere. It doesn't really go away. The only way it goes away is if it's absorbed into the ocean's waters in for long-term storage. So there's lots of people proposing long-term storage for CO2, but uh, it, it is a very, very difficult problem. What we need to do is try to minimize how much we use, and therefore the CO2 will go down. So this, our book talked a little about, about the Kyoto Protocol, um, and this happened a while ago where the, the industrialized nations leaders got together and said, you know, we need to kind of put a, a, a a damper on how much fossil fuel we're using. But it was just kind of like uh, the United Nations. It was just some ideas with no enforcement. There's no way to make a country do something. Um, the United States, in 
in Australia didn't ratify this protocol. They didn't agree to what was being stipulated. And there was no enforcement to make people do it anyway. So anyway, you can read about the Kyoto Protocol and how it was an attempt for the world to get a handle on this, but it really wasn't effective nor did people really abide by anything in the Kyoto Protocol. <coughs> Okay, the last little thing in this chapter we're going to talk about is ozone and the ozone layer and one of the interesting problems associated with that. So this, this quiz is kind of gearing up for that. And the answer is Antarctica. That is where the significant ozone depletion in the stratosphere was first discovered. Something caused an ozone hole. Something that people did caused a measurable impact in the ozone concentration in the Antarctic, in the stratosphere. Which one was it? <sighs> the answer is chlorine. And I'll probably go, go through the chemistry for this a little bit because it is really interesting chemistry. We learned about ultraviolet radiation and uh, how it has, there's three parts in the UV spectrum, UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVC, the photons in that are higher in energy than B or A. So the ozone in the stratosphere essentially absorbs all the UVC and about half of the UVB before it can even get to the Earth's surface. So it scrubs out the most dangerous part. Um, but we still can be exposed to UVB, some of it, and all of the UVA, which is still high enough in energy to increase risk for skin cancer, cataracts, and weaken our immune system. So the, these two reactions on the bottom show how ozone actually absorbs UV. You take an ozone molecule, it get hits with the right energy of photon, and it breaks off one of those oxygen atoms. And so now this has been absorbed, and we have an oxygen singlet, an O2. This is a self it's a cycle, these two things react again to form ozone and you get some heat out. And so the stratosphere actually is a little bit warmer than you think it should be because of the ozone that's up there. It's still really cold, but it's still warmer than you would think. It's warmer than top of the troposphere. The problem with the ozone layer was discovered in the 1980s and the culprit it was determined are chlorofluorocarbons. This word CFC stands for chlorofluorocarbons. And let me, we'll talk about the chemistry of this because it's, it's very interesting. Um, the devel development of CFCs was actually quite a remarkable chemical advancement. Chlorofluorocarbons were developed in the early 1900s. And they were great. They were colorless, odorless, non-toxic, inert, inexpensive. They had some very unique properties as far as being able to absorb huge amounts of energy without them themselves gaining or increasing in temperature. So they could be used in air conditioning systems and refrigerators. And because they were not toxic, it wouldn't destroy the air conditioning system in your car or in your home or in your refrigerator. This, the chlorofluorocarbons would just cycle around and do their job and stay for years and years. They wouldn't decompose. They, would, they just work great. They, they're just such wonderful, wonderful molecules. Here's some things that, they're, uh, used, that they were used in. Propellants, solvents, foaming agents, because they work so great. Here's a picture of some CFCs. Um, chlorofluorocarbon is what that stands for. Uh, chloro meaning chlorine atoms and fluoro meaning fluorine atoms on carbons. 
So notice there's no hydrogen on these things. It's just, it kind of looks like methane, except there's no hydrogen. And there's several different ki types of CFCs, you know, depending on how many chlorines and chlorines you have relative to each other. But they work great, and the reason that they're not reactive is because there's no hydrogen on them. The chlorine and fluorine are, when they're in that molecule, are very inert, and that molecule is very inert. So that's a really, that turned out to be the real problem for these CFCs. The inertness allowed them to, to once they were released in the troposphere, they didn't react with water, they didn't get rained out, and then some of them eventually would make their way to the stratosphere. And that's where it began to be a problem. These CFCs also can react with ultraviolet light. And it releases, it, it see a, a molecule will be hit by the right wavelength of UV light, and a fluorine atom gets knocked off. It releases an atomic chlorine, and this chlorine reacts with ozone. So now the ozone's got something else to react with, not just the UV light coming in, it's got a chlorine atom that will destroy it. This word catalytic destruction, a catalyst is something that facilitates a reaction, but doesn't get used up in the reaction. So, a chlorine atom can destroy an ozone molecule and, and then it can exist, it still exists as a chlorine atom after it's done destroying it and it destroys another ozone and then it destroys an, another ozone. One chlorine atom can destroy tens of thousands of ozone molecules in this catalytic destru destruction. And so it's regenerating the process of this. So here's, here's kind of the reactions that they're doing. Here's the CFC, absorbs some UV light, knocks off one of the chlorines, and then you've got this thing that doesn't really do anything. This is the problem. The CL reacts with the ozone to form this intermediary and O2. Then you have the normal ozone reaction happening. You have some oxygen and O2 made. The CLO, this stuff, reacts with that to form that chlorine atom again and O2. So if you add up all of these reactions, in chemistry you can actually add reactions to get an overall reaction. So if you, if you do an overall reaction, the net reaction is, whoops, the net reaction is taking, I need to write it down because I actually didn't I get right on the court. So the, the net reaction of, of all of this, if you take away the stuff that's the same on both sides of the reactions and end product, the net reaction is taking two ozone molecules and you end up getting three oxygen molecules. Because everything else cancels out. And so this is called a catalytic catalytic destruction of ozone. And the, the catalyst is that chlorine free radical that gets knocked off by a chlorofluorocarbon being emitted and getting up to the stratosphere. So it turned out that there's some very unique atmospheric conditions in the Antarctic region that made an ozone hole appear. And by ozone hole, it means the concentration of the ozone in the stratosphere in the Antarctic became very, very low. That was what, what is meant by an ozone hole, is the concentration was depleted by the CFCs. So here's the little statement that tells you why the Antarctic was special, why it happened just over the Antarctic. Um, the Antarctic tur turns out has very unique atmospheric con conditions. There's a polar vortex that keeps the air masses isolated, and the temperatures get really, really cold, and there's no sunlight for a long, long time. So 
these chlorine free radicals can actually build up. They can react to form Cl2. It's kind of stored there until the sun comes out. And as soon as the sun comes out, those chlorine just starts gobbling up the ozone like crazy. Um, and it decreases the concentration of the ozone like, like nothing else. These are some pictures from the 70s and 80s uh, and 90s that, that show ozone concentration. The one on the top left, the light blue, means that there really wasn't very much ozone in, in, the, in the Antarctic in October. Um, but as the blue got darker and bigger, it meant the, hopefully I'm reading that right. I, I think I am because the CFCs were banned and then the ozone hole started, um, started healing itself. So what happened once they figured out, once scientists figured out that ozone was being depleted, there was a, an immediate rush to ban CFCs. All the, all the industrialized nations got on board with this, and they phased out the CFCs. Um, it took a few years to phase them out, but they, they did. All the industrialized nations. And it was used, the CFCs were used in so much. This was a picture of a hairspray we used to use CFCs is the propellant. Um, so the Montreal Protocol was, was the kind of the international cry for CFCs to be limited. Um, George Bush phased out CFCs in, in 1990s, the mid 1990s in the United States, and that deadline was met. Some of the things are still transitioning. Um, just a couple years ago, um, asthma inhalers had to not use CFCs as a propellant anymore. So that, that had to be reformulated. Um, so because of these worldwide initiatives by the industrialized nation, the ozone hole stabilized and started to heal itself. And the, the problem, why, why it was such a problem was because if you decrease the concentration of ozone in one area over the Antarctic, it actually creates an overall global decrease in ozone concentrations. And that overall decrease results in not as much ultraviolet light being absorbed by in the stratosphere, which would increase the risk of skin cancers and cataracts and all the other problems that, that having an ozone layer helps them. So it was very important that this was discovered and taken care of and it was really, really very much a success story. Um, this top graph shows you what would have happened if you didn't have controls and the bottom graph shows what, or the bottom line on that top graph shows what has happened to the uh, concentration in parts per billion. So it's going down and continues to go down. The very bottom graph shows the concentrations up to 2007 um, in Antarctica. And you can see that the, uh, the total ozone really hit a low in the 1990s. So that, that graph that I, that those pictures of the, of the the globe that we looked at earlier, the bigger blue meant the bigger the hole, so I was, I was mistaken. Because the, the lowest part was in the 1990s, the ozone concentrations of the lowest then. And now they're starting to creep back up, and we wanted to get back to the level that they were before people were using CFCs in the 40s and 50s. So that's pretty much everything. Uh, good luck. <laughs>